let's get this thing started. How the heck is everyone? I'm gonna need more than that, come on. How, how the heck is everybody? Thank you, thank you. I think it makes me feel more comfortable. Um, thank you so much for uh, coming to this humble little talk. I'm really glad that of all the talks out there, you decided to come to this one. Um, I'm feeling the, feeling the feels right now. Uh, so in this talk, we're gonna talk about JavaScript. Um, I feel like I won the lottery being able to talk about JavaScript at a Ruby conference, and I feel like it's one of those pieces of the rail stack that's still just pretty terrible in general. And um, we have an opportunity to talk about how to make it a little bit better. Um, but it's interesting, at this particular conference, there's actually been a lot of talk about JavaScript. I'm talking about like prepper backpacks and like the zombie apocalypse and whether or not JavaScript should be in your zombie apocalypse prepper backpack. Try to say that five times fast. Um, and so I wanted to tell you just about how we solved the JavaScript problem, or not how we solved it, but how we're using the right view framework to help us write better Rails apps and better JavaScript on those Rails apps. My name is Michael Chan. I go by Chantastic on Twitter. And there's a much younger, happy version of me you might find there. Uh, so I work on an application called Services. Uh, it's, it was launched in 2006, and it started on Rails 1.13. Um, Services is an application um, for churches, actually. It helps, us, uh, helps churches organize volunteers, uh, their timelines, services, all that kind of stuff. It's pretty cool, and believe it or not, there is actually a market for, uh, for church software. So, uh, I mean, it started in 2006, so our approach to JavaScript has kind of been, yes, write it. And as you know, after a little bit of time, uh, sprinkles tend to turn into mountains. <laughs> so we needed a way to better structure our JavaScript applications, right? Um, so in 2012, when we were writing our second app, we started to kind of look at the landscape and see what people were doing. Uh, so we looked at bigger rail shops, we looked at Shopify, and uh, they were just starting to work on a project called Batman.js. Um, has anyone in here used Batman.js? Oh, good for you guys, or good for y'all. Um, yeah, so uh, anyway, so we did this, and it was really interesting. I mean, it had all of the uh, kind of uh, markers of a 2012 JavaScript framework. Uh, it was you know, two-way binding, and you know, you'd set up a whole bunch of observers to kind of track state and update things and whatnot. And so we built our application in two pieces. We had the API on one side and we had the client side app that customers actually interfaced with. Um, now, this actually created a whole new host of problems for us, right? Because now we had two sets of controllers and two sets of models and two sets of uh, validations and two routers. And like, you don't realize how much you really enjoy Form 4 until you don't have it anymore. And it's like, uh, it's terrible. Um, so really our app started to feel like this. Right? We just had like two cakes like stacked on top of each other. And like this was a terrible situation. Um, any change you know, in the front end app re resulted in a change in the back end app, and it was just no good. Um, we since changed this app, but I asked uh, the product manager for that team. I said, okay, do you have any particularly juicy cards where state was like just unbearable in our Batman app and uh, was kind of solved in our, um, when we moved it back to, to just Rails? He said, are you kidding? Like, all of them. He then proceeded to send you like eight cards and eventually gave up and said, okay, just search for cards that have hard refresh in them. And so what this means is we had, <laughs> so we had parts of our app that were so unreliable that the best solution for our JavaScript application was just to say like, oh, if, if a user ever comes to this route, it's probably not gonna work, let's just refresh it. That's ridiculous. So as you can imagine, or as you might know, Shopify kind of abandoned Batman JS in 2014. We're kind of like left holding this hand, like what do we do? Like, um, and they've actually been pretty vocal against client-side MVC um, since then. Uh, so this is uh, Toby, the CEO there, just talking about how ridiculous client-side is. I think he tweeted at some point about how the Batman project had cost them like $100,000 or something like that, and just up in smoke. Um, and as David mentioned yesterday, uh, or on Tuesday, uh, 
uh, Batman, <laughs> Shopify has been really instrumental in um, kind of building out TurboLinks 3. So again, we kind of followed Shopify's lead, and as we built the rest of our apps, or rebuilt some of our Batman apps, uh, we rebuilt them squarely on the Rails path, right? And you know, Rails path, Sprinkles, SJR, TurboLinks, and actually, to be honest, we kind of like it. I know that that's you know like controversial in here, but like you know, we're we're pretty into it. Uh, but we were still writing a lot of JavaScript. There were a lot of places. Um, this is from a pull request uh, that was opened. Uh, it, it's just a GIF, kind of like showing something where we have um, a lot of like transient state, right? Like this isn't event. That's, this isn't an event that's going to get sent to the server and then respond with some you know uh, server rendered JavaScript, right? Like this is purely for the user. Um, this is just a user interaction. It doesn't need to be handled by a Rails controller. Uh, we also have pages that are like fully real time. So um, as I was saying, we have services. We have a service that plan, helps you plan services. Um, and then this is kind of like a, a rundown for that. And this happens in real time. You have, we use Pusher to connect a ton of devices. We have iOS devices. And the person running the presentation can you know, move through. And that's going to kind of change these items. It tracks how much time has gone by. There's like a real time chat thing. It's like, I mean, it's. Pretty exciting. It's like a JavaScript MVC's person's like dream. Um, so what we needed was we needed something that would actually scale um, from these small interactions that we needed it for um, to these big full-on pages of our applications where everything was real time. Um, and we found React to be instrumental in that, and instrumental in us being able to stay on the Rails path, but then just use as little JavaScript as we needed to solve a job. Uh, particularly this concept of React components. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, I have two goals for this talk. So my first goal is, is that you'd be able to walk out of here and ship a React feature in an hour. It'll take you like five minutes to set up, and then like you have 55 minutes to code. So that's my goal. If any of you accomplish it, you know, tell me, and I'll like give you like a digital high five. Um, <laughs> And then my second goal is that you don't make the same mistakes that we did. We made a ton of mistakes. I mean, as you can see, we made a ton of mistakes in JavaScript, and we made a ton of mistakes just porting our uh, application logic to uh, React. So I don't want you to make the same mistakes that we did. I'm going to try to show you kind of the, the ideal path that we're using right now for all of our new development. So let's do a React primer. Uh, React is a JavaScript library by Facebook. It's for creating user interfaces using components. Components do three things. They render, they receive props, and they maintain state. You, you would do pretty well to think about a React component as a partial with locals. So let's say we have a, an audio service, and we want to show the songs that are in this album. right? So this partial should make sense to anyone who's done Rails for a day. And so that'll render out something like this. It'll render out an unloaded list of songs. This particular list is 1989 by Taylor Swift. Yes, thank you. I may or may not have been able to create this list um, from my mind, but. <laughs> uh, so we're just going to do the easiest steps we can, right? We're just going to create a new partial file. We'll just dump the whole thing in there, and then we'll say render songs, right? Easy. So now if we really want this to be reusable, right, we can't say album songs here, right? We want to kind of abstract that a little bit. And so we'll just say songs. We'll require some type of local data. And then our view, we update this to say, OK, songs is going to be album songs. And so now if we want to show a list of Taylor Swift albums, these are like I, I, each of these albums has to have like at least 50 plays on my iTunes, like, which is the best. Um, so we're just going to iterate over the albums. I'm going to spit out the title. And we're going to use our partial again. Now, these are different, but because we're, yeah, because we're sending songs in as locals, it doesn't matter. The partial doesn't care. So you know this. So let's do it in JavaScript now. So instead of render partial, uh, we have a little helper called React Component. And instead of using songs, which is going to look for the songs partial, we would use uh, the songs, which is going to look for the songs component in the window object. Yeah. Which one? 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I'm going to, sorry, this is the same partial code. I, I'm just blocking parts of it out. So, all right. So now we're going to grab songs off of the, wow, these look terrible now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, so we're going to use the songs component off the window object. Um, instead of sending locals in, um, we just send a hash in. But it's the same thing. We just say songs, album songs. And in React, we call these props, short for properties. So props are immutable, kind of. Uh, if you were at Yehuda's Rust talk yesterday, um, he talked about how Rust has this concept of, of ownership and borrowing, and how ownership is the right to destroy or modify something. And uh, when you pass something down as props, like that component should not modify it, destroy it. Like They just have a, a, the ability to view and use it. Uh, so let's define our component. Um, is there, can everyone see this now? Everything's looking good? Okay, cool. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a songs variable. We'll say react create class. That's a class with a render function. Okay, we're going to render out an unordered list. We're going to grab the songs off of props. And we're going to iterate over it with map. So it's a little bit different than the Ruby code above it. And because we don't have blocks, we're going to actually call a function for each of these, um, for each of these items which is going to take the song and spit it out as a list item, song.name. All right, let's go, let's go over that one more time again, just real quick. Uh, so we have songs, it's a re, uh, React class, has render function, UL, grabs the songs off of props, maps over them, calls this function for each song, and returns a list item with a song name. OK, so let's practice. So I had this idea of let's take a, a a Rails app that everyone here knows about. We'll take the 15-minute blog, and we'll add some real-time comments to it. Whoa. <laughs> OK, so if you um, haven't seen the 15-minute blog, um, this is the inverted version of the 15-minute blog. <laughs> um, so there's a, um, there's a block in there like this, where we have posts. And we're going to iterate over each comment and spit out the uh, comment body with an HR, because it's 2003. Uh, so let's go straight to, straight to React. So we'll create a comment. Uh, it's a React class with a render function. And that render function is going to return a div with an HR in it. And we're going to take our comment right off of props and interpolate that out. OK, pretty simple. So here in our view, we're going to use our React um, component helper. We're going to spit out the comment component Man, it's hard to say. I should have chose a different example. Comment component and uh, use the comment.body there, right? So our app goes from looking like this to looking like this. The astute viewer will say those look exactly the same, and they would be correct. Except now these two comments are being rendered in JavaScript. So that's pretty cool. So let's, uh, let's do the rest of this. We're going to take the whole block now. Uh, we saw this with songs. We're going to create comments. It's a React class, the render function. Spits out a div, takes all the comments, maps over them, runs this function for each. We're going to pull out the body of the comment. And in React, we have this cool syntax where we can use our comment like, um, like an HTML tag. right? So we didn't have to do anything. We just uh, run that. And we can send in a comment, like we were with props, um, as an HTML attribute. So that's cool. So we're just going to send in the body. Cool. Take that out. Change this to comments. Send all the comments down. And now our app goes from looking like this to looking like this. The astute observers, again, say that looks exactly the same. And you are correct. Um, except now the entire comment blocks, uh, block is rendered in JavaScript. That's pretty cool. Um, so let's get to the real time bit, right? So we have a comments component that renders out comments. We have a comment component that renders out a single comment. And we're going to create a comments container. And what this is, you can think about this kind of like a uh, Rails controller, right? So this comments container, it knows how to fetch comments, and it knows which component to render when it has the comments it wants. So again, think about this kind of like a Rails controller. Um, this isn't special, it's just kind of a convention, this container convention. Uh, so here, uh, we're going to kind of ditch all the stuff that we had before where we're rendering out the comments directly. And we're going to now give, um, so we're going to use the cont comments container. And we're going to give it a path now. 
and say, hey, this is where you're going to fetch comments. This is where you're going to fetch the um, JSON for comments. And this is that, what that comments container looks like. This first half is the fetching um, of the comments. We have our render function at the bottom. And we have this get initial state. So these are the APIs that we're going to talk about. This is, um, these are just the things that we haven't talked about yet. These are for kind of managing state and whatnot. Um, these are the places where we actually um, interact with and set that state. So let's, uh, let's dive into it. So we have a uh, comments container. It returns a uh, comments component. And we're going to start by just giving it comments of like an empty array, right? So this, isn't, so this is going to render out nothing. Hey, this is our first interact, uh, interaction with state. And so we have a special object for that in React. I, um, there's props and state. It's the only two ways that you interact with data. Uh, this is the second of those. This is state. So where props is immutable, um, state is designed to change. This container, com this comments container, um, knows what state comments is in, and it knows how to get new comments and how to set those comments. Um, so now we can use this, uh, this API called get initial state, and this is just a way to kind of protect ourselves um, when we're doing um, an asynchronous call to the first time we render, render with an empty state at least, not send undefines all over the place. So again, our, uh, we're getting our state from a common state. All right, so this is our function. This is pretty simple. We're actually um, going to take the um, comments path prop that we sent in, and we're going to fetch that JSON. Uh, on six, um, oh, sorry, that we passed in from that view. Um, on success, we're going to take that data, and we're going to use a special function called set state. I'm going to say, hey, the state is now, um, is now the new data that we got back. Uh, you can think about this set state as like a refresh, a refresh button for your component. Okay? It, um, anytime you call this method with new state, it's going to totally re-render anything that's downline of that tree. So in that case, it's going to render our, components, or our comments component and subsequently every component after that. Um, we have another hook here that we can use. It's called component will mount. Um, and that's just an initializer function. So when this component's ready to go, it's initialized, we can um, run this function. And here we're just going to say, hey, get, get all the comments. And we want to do that every second. So we're just going to use polling for now. I'll show you some more um, interesting examples later. Um, so now, for the first time, we actually see a change. Um, hopefully, you can see it. But as I add comments to the left screen, they're going to get loaded in the right screen. This isn't particularly exciting, but we didn't write a whole lot of code to get here. And the code that we wrote is all in one place. Like, it's totally isolated to those three component files. We didn't have to change, like, you know, a JavaScript file and then update our view to have, like, a DOM node and all that kind of stuff. We just, it's all there. This is totally isolated. We can, you know, implement it totally differently, you know, in the future if we need. It, it's very cool. Um, so another cool thing about React that I want to show you is, um, it's very smart about the way that it does updates. It might be kind of hard to see, but if you look at that list of comments, you'll see that it's only doing an insert of the last comment that I added. So the way this works is that React does re-render on, on every set state. So right here, we're setting a state with new comments. Um, it does re-render, but it renders in memory. And then it just does a diff to say, like, hey, how am I different than the DOM? And then it renders, or it says, OK, we need to change these few things, and then we'll be up to date. But it doesn't like, grab the whole thing out and then just do an insert of the whole comment block. This is also pretty cool for a lot of performance reasons. Um, so I showed you about like four things right there to actually manipulate state. So what are a lot of, um, what are the number of things that you need to know to be effective with React right off the bat? Well, it's not too many. I'll show you a couple of things. Um, that I've shown you already, and those that we haven't. Uh, so, uh, so first, this is how you render out a component in your JavaScript or in your Rails views. Uh, this is how you send in props. Super easy. So, this is a greeting component. We're going to say hi Bob or something like that. Um, this is how you define a component. We're just returning an H2 that says hi, and then we're interpolating the name out. Um, there's a thing called prop types, which is pretty cool, where you can actually specify um, what type name should be, um, which is really handy when you want to re for, for the reusability of these components. 
Um, it's really awesome because um, now in development, if someone tries to use this greeting component and they're not quite sure how it works, um, if they try to send in a number, they're gonna get a really cool error like the, or warning like this in the console. And it's just gonna say, hey, you're trying to use greeting, um, but you're sending in a number as name and we really need a string. Uh, there's a method called get default props. And this is kind of like set initial state, where, or get initial state, where you, um, where you can set an initial value. So if someone uses this component and they don't pass in a name, we're just gonna say guest. So we'll say hi guest. You can kind of think of this as like an or equals in Ruby. Uh, set state, this is like the refresh button of your React components. Uh, get initial state, you saw this. We can kind of set an initial state for our component. Uh, component will mount. This is where you would do things like get JSON. This is um, as soon as the component's ready, we're going to fire off something and you know get some new data and handle that data. It also has a sibling called component will unmount, and this is for things like if you are attaching event listeners. So you would have component will mount and component will unmount. As this component goes in and out of view, um, uh, you'd attach event listener and then you would kind of remove that event listener and clean up after yourself. Uh, this works if you were using server sent events. Um, with pusher, we're using pusher. Pretty cool. So it's about nine things you need to know. Like that's not a lot of things, right? Not a lot of things. Are you guys alive out there? You gals alive out there? Everybody alive out there? Um, so this is nine things. This is an incredibly small amount of things that you need to know. And we're not, telling, um, we're not telling it how to be smart about updates. It's just doing that by itself. We're not, um, you're not grabbing DOM nodes and like changing them out and doing all this stuff. We're just saying, hey, we want this to render. Whatever the state is, just like, you know, render that state. You know, just every time you render, just you know, do it the right way and then figure out on your own time how to you know, insert in the most effective way. So I want to show you a little example. This is from um, our services live app that I was telling you about in the beginning. Um, so if you watch, you can see the clock in the app. This looks so weird. Um, so you can see the clock, and you can see on the right, the only updates happening is, is that like inner HTML, which is really cool. Like, I, I mean, this whole, like, it, in memory, this entire app is re-rendering, and it's just sending in the, it's just sending in the new time. So this is, we're getting you know, second snapshots of this application. Uh, here's the, uh, the chat application. Um, as I add comments, you can look in the, uh, the table right there. It's just going to insert those table roles, rows. Uh, so I want to talk, uh, shift a little bit to implementation. Uh, so this is something we struggled with a lot. There was, um, at one point, every single app that we had that used React was doing it a different way. Um, so I'm not going to tell you all five or six ways that we were doing it, but I will tell you the way that we, that we landed on, the way that we feel is the most um, effective and the most honoring of Rails in the asset pipeline. Um, so we use the React Rails gem. This buys you a couple things. It buys you that helper that I was telling you about, the React component helper um, that we've been using in all these examples. Um, it's really smart. It uses UJS to mount and unmount your components, and it's really smart about TurboLinks. So whether you use TurboLinks or don't use TurboLinks, um, it's gonna do the right thing. It's very simple to set up. You just add this gem, you run this installer, and the installer is really pretty minimal. All it does is really give you a uh, components directory to, um, you know, to put all your components in. Uh, it also gives you this really cool generator. Uh, so you just say React component greeting, and it'll spit out this really cool, you know, all the code you need to um, render out a greeting. Um, it allows you, it has a nice little syntax for uh, prop types. So if you know that you need a name and a string, um, it'll render out this for you. With the prop types in the top. Um, so if you haven't used Rails assets, this is an incredibly cool project. Um, what it does is it works on Bower, and so it will, uh, here, let's see. It works on Bower. Um, so in your gem file, all you have to do is add this source block, and then you add, the, um, you add these gems that you can find on the React, uh, Rails Assets site. And so as you can see, there's just a prefix, a Rails Assets Alt, Rails Assets React Router or whatever. And what, um, what Rails Assets does is it, it works on Bower and it'll pull down the Bower repository alt or React Router or MomJS. 
It'll pull that down and it will create an honest to goodness gem for you and return that to you. So you have like an honest to goodness gem created from a Bower JavaScript or CSS repository. And this is super easy. This is the easiest way that we've found to be able to um, pull cool JavaScript libraries into our Rails apps. Um, so the mistake we made was fighting the asset pipeline. We worked a lot with um, trying to use Browserify or Webpack and all this kind of stuff. And there are benefits there, and I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards about what those are. Um, but we found that, for the most part, the easiest, the easiest solution was the best solution for us. Um, so this is great. It communicates well, and our teams are really happy with it. Uh, let's talk about languages. So some of you might have been uh, watching and saying, like, Okay, I don't understand what this uh, what this magic is happening. Uh, the whole like HTML and JavaScript, and so some of you might have heard the controversy around JSX, and um, I don't really think this is a big big deal. Uh, I like it. I like seeing uh, JavaScript right here in my components. It's nice that I don't have a separate file that's doing this. And at the end of the day, um, it's no different than the way like ERB works or handlebars works. It's just processing out. Uh, it's pre-processing our um, JSX into function calls like this. But we don't have to look at that. We don't have to write that. We can just write it as if we were writing HTML. All right. Um, so that's the JavaScript one. Um, <laughs> React Rails comes out of the box with support for CoffeeScript. So you would just append the coffee on the back. Um, so you lose a couple of brackets and parentheses and whatnot. The, Weird part is that you have to backtick escape out the JSX, which isn't a huge problem if you really love CoffeeScript that much. Uh, we don't, so we just don't use it. Um, it's also weird that you have to use this because this is being backtick, backtick escaped. Um, you can't use at inside your component. You can use it everywhere else, but I'm sorry, inside the template. You can use it everywhere else, um, but not inside the template. Uh, so what we've really come to love is uh, ES6. There's a Little uh, flag you can set up in the React Rails gem um, that will convert uh, ES6 into ES5 for you. So um, this is great. Now this has a little bit of a different syntax, which is um, which is fine. You get used to it. We really love it because it buys us all of the things that we really love about CoffeeScript, um, but uh, not CoffeeScript, and we can just return this JSX right there. Um, so the first thing that's a little bit different is that you um, define things as a class. So we define this as a greeting class, and it extends React components. So before we were creating, a, we were using create class to define our components. Um, here we're going to just extend the class React component. Um, also, prop types get pulled out of um, of the class, and they're used as a, uh, a constructor property. Um, two things, pretty simple. Uh, one nice thing is that you can actually, um, uh, React is ex extremely smart. I was telling you about the great warnings and errors that you can tie into. Um, so if you try to use an API that's strictly dedicated to the create, create class way of doing things, when you try to do this as a class, um, you're gonna get a warning. And it's gonna say, hey, get initial state was defined on comment, a plain JavaScript class. This is only supported for classes created using react.create class, did you mean to define a state property instead? Like, this is an amazing error. And it's like all just like switching from like JavaScript to like ES6. And like, like they're doing amazing, like I don't even know how they like figure this out for me. And they're telling me exactly what I need to do. They're telling me where I, where I need to solve this problem and what I'm doing wrong, and what I need to do. You could learn a thing or two about copywriting from this error. This is amazing. <laughs> Anyway, so we go and, uh, oops, let me change that to the right thing, which I apparently don't have a slide for. <laughs> uh, so early on, we made the mistake of not embracing JSX. We did a lot of somersaults to try to get around using JSX and just drawing out the functions ourselves and CoffeeScript and whatnot. And we found that the best path is just to embrace JSX. You really start to love it after about like an hour and um, this is where uh, Facebook and the React team is hiding a lot of the implementation details from you. So the most painful updates that we've ever had are the ones where we were trying to use CoffeeScript instead of JSX, and something wasn't hidden from us because of that. So use JSX, it's awesome. 
Don't make the mistake we did. Uh, use ES6 is really great, and I'm starting to see more and more uh, documentation in React um, using ES6. I think it's the way, um, way moving forward. I, a, a lot of people who are using React really embrace ES6. Uh, so I want to leave you this morning um, with just this concept of only as much JavaScript as you need. Uh, the idea here is um, stick to the Rails path as much as you can, and um, just, just do the minimal amount of JavaScript you need. And I feel like React helps you there. Um, so this is our, oh man, my cakes look all funky now. <laughs> uh, so this is your Rails app. <laughs> Inverted. Um, this is your Rails app with sprinkles. And this is your Rails app after two years of sprinkles. Uh, this is your Rails app using a client-side MVC. And this is what I imagine TurboLinks 3 to be like, where you're actually using the sprinkles to kind of like pin down the Ruby views on top of the cake, but I, I don't know. Uh, and this is the party that we're having uh, with React.js at Planning Center. Thanks so much. <laughs>